Hey guys, welcome to a special episode dedicated to Rolling Stones' Beef with Led Zeppelin. Today we take a look at their studio album reviews, including Coda. For years we've heard the stories of the magazine trashing every Zeppelin album ever made. There was even a scene about this in the movie Almost Famous. So I decided to revisit the Rolling Stone archive and read the hatred from critics to see if all they had to say was bad, or maybe, just maybe, they got some of it right. For this episode I used the aid of special guest stars and so you don't have to hear me talking through the entire review. Thus, I can provide my comments in between. And of course, as I'm talking right now, there's a plane passing by. Gotta get this airplane on. Not even. We begin our first review by American writer, journalist, musician and graphic designer, John Mendelssohn. Dated March 15th, 1969, just as Led Zeppelin began their second tour of Scandinavia. The popular formula in England in this, the aftermath era of such successful British bluesmen as Cream and John Mayall, seems to be add to an excellent guitarist who, since leaving the Yardbirds and or Mayall, has become a minor musical deity, a competent rhythm section and pretty soul belter who can do a good spade imitation. The latest of the British blues groups so conceived offers little that its twin, the Jeff Beck group, didn't say as well or better three months ago, and the excesses of the Beck group's truth album, most notably its self-indulgence and restrictedness, are fully in evidence on Led Zeppelin's debut album. John is definitely right that Led Zeppelin 1 is a brother album to Jeff Beck's group Truth that features their own take on You Shook Me. Jimmy Page, around whom the Zeppelin revolves, is, admittedly, an extraordinarily proficient blues guitarist and explorer of his instrument's electronic capabilities. Unfortunately, he is also a very limited producer and a writer of weak, unimaginative songs. What did you just say? And the Zeppelin album suffers from his having both produced it and written most of it, alone or in combination with his accomplices in the group. Not sure if Mr. Mendelssohn paid close attention to the album's mix and sonic design that speak of Jimmy's brilliant role as producer. He was everything but limited. Their debut sounds fresh to this day, and there was nothing that sounded like this back in 1969. While most songs on the album are cover tunes, Page definitely had vision to arrange them in very imaginative ways. The album opens with lots of guitar rhythm section exchanges, in the fashion of Beck's Shapes of Things, on Good Times Bad Times, which might have been ideal for a Yardbird's B-side. Here, as almost everywhere else on the album, it is Page's guitar that provides most of the excitement. Babe I'm Gonna Leave You alternates between Prissy Robert Plant's howled vocals fronting an acoustic guitar and driving choruses of the band running down a four-chord progression while John Bonham smashes his cymbals on every beat. The song is very dull in places, especially on the vocal passages, very redundant, and certainly not worth the six and a half minutes the Zeppelin gives it. Babe I'm Gonna Leave You has a simple structure, yes, but the textures and feel are that of an epic adventure. Prime Robert Plant's voice announces the arrival of future kings. So I have a word for the critic. Yeah, you. How's that? Too much overdone Willie Dixon blues standards fail to be revivified by being turned into showcases for Page and Plant. You Shook Me is the more interesting of the two. At the end of each line Plant's echo chambered voice drops into a small explosion of fuzz tone guitar, with which it matches shrieks at the end. The album's most representative cut is, how many more times? Here a jazzy introduction gives way to a driving, albeit monotonous, guitar-dominated background for Plant's strained and unconvincing shouting. He may be as foppish as Rod Stewart, but he's nowhere near so exciting, especially in the higher registers. A fine page solo then leads the band into what sounds like a backwards version of the page composed, Bex Bolero, hence to a little snatch of Albert King's, The Hunter, and finally to an avalanche of drums and shouting. Mendelssohn is wrong about putting Robert Plant below Rod Stewart, but I agree how many more times is one of the most original numbers on the album. It was certainly a workout for the band, going through so many emotions while opening the door into their live jam chemistry. Now it's funny how the Bex Bolero reference is noticeable for the critic. I guess Jeff's resentment towards Jimmy back then was just natural. Beck later stated that Page came up with the chords, but the melody was his. Track listing on Truth states Jimmy Page is the composer for Bex Polero. In their willingness to waste their considerable talent on unworthy material, the Zeppelin has produced an album which is sadly reminiscent of Truth. Like the Beck group, they are also perfectly willing to make themselves a two, or, more accurately, one a half, man show. It would seem that, if they're to help fill the void created by the demise of Cream, they will have to find a producer, an editor, and some material worthy of their collective attention. Mendelssohn was right about one thing. Led Zeppelin filled the void created by Cream. 
many times over. The review for Led Zeppelin II came out on December 13th, 1969, while the band took a month vacation from touring, only to go back for a UK tour in January. It is worth noting that John Mendelssohn was infamous for writing this review with a heavy use of sarcasm. How I wish Peter Grant paid a visit to him back then to discuss his writings. Hey, man, I take it all back. This is one f***ing heavyweight of the album. Okay, I'll concede that until you've listened to the album 800 times, as I have, it seems as if it's just one especially heavy song extended over the space of two whole sides. But, hey, you've got to admit that the Zeppelin has their distinctive and enchanting formula down stone cold, man. Like you get the impression they could do it in their sleep. And who can deny that Jimmy Page is the absolute number one heaviest white blues guitarist between 5 feet 4 inches and 5 feet 8 inches in the world. Man, on this album he further demonstrates that he could absolutely f***ing shut down any white bluesman alive, and with one f***ing hand tied behind his back too. Whole lot of love, which opens the album, has to be the heaviest thing I've run across, or, more accurately, that's run across me, since, Parchment Farm, on Vincibus Eruptum. Like I listened to the break, Jimmy wrenching some simply indescribable sounds out of his axe while your stereo goes apeshit on some heavy Vietnamese weed and very nearly had my mind blown. Note, Vince Eubus Erupton is the 1968 debut of American band Blue Cheer, which is considered one of the first heavy metal albums. It's a must listen to any classic rock fan. Hey, I know what you're thinking. That's not very objective. But dig, I also listened to it on Mescaline, some old Romilar, Novocaine, and Ground Up Fusion, and it was just as mind-boggling as before. I must admit I haven't listened to it straight yet, I don't think a group this heavy is best enjoyed that way. Anyhow, Robert Plant, who is rumored to sing some notes on this record that only dogs can hear, demonstrates his heaviness on The Lemon Song. When he yells, shake me, till the juice runs down my leg, you can't help but flash on the fact that the lemon is a cleverly disguised phallic metaphor. Cunning Rob, sticking all this eroticism in between the lines just like his blues belt and ancestors. And then, then, there's Moby Dick, which will be for John Bonham what Toad has been for Baker. John demonstrates on this track that had he half a mind he could shut down Baker even without sticks, as most of his intriguing solo is done with bare hands. Hmm, some good things to say about John Bonham. I bet Ginger Baker was pissed off by this. The album ends with a far out blues number called Bring It On Home, during which Rob contributes some very convincing moaning and harp playing, and sings Wadge Da Train Roll Down Da Track. Who said that white men couldn't sing blues? I mean, like, who? We move on to Lester Bangs, known as America's greatest critic. This is the man who said Black Sabbath were imitators of Cream back in 1970 and was fired from Rolling Stone after writing a very nasty review of Can Heat. His freelance work with Cream magazine made him quite popular in the punk rock and new wave scenes. He was personified by Philip Seymour Hoffman in Almost Famous. His review of Led Zeppelin III was published on November 29, 1970, days away from Led Zeppelin's Island Studio Sessions for the fourth album. Yes, this is when the rhythm tracks for Stairway to Heaven were recorded. I keep nursing this love-hate attitude toward Led Zeppelin, partly from genuine interest and mostly indefensible hopes, in part from the conviction that nobody that crass could be all that bad, I turn to each fresh album expecting. What? Certainly not subtle echoes of the monolithic yardbirds, or authentic blues experiments, or even much variety. Maybe it's just that they seem like the ultimate 70s calf of gold. The zap of all bands surviving are today, their music is as ephemeral as Marvel Comics, and as vivid as an old Technicolor cartoon. It doesn't challenge anybody's intelligence or sensibilities, relying instead on a pat visceral impact that will ensure absolute stardom for many moons to come. Lester Banks died in 1982. You'd think the cause of death was related to these disrespectful comments, but no. He overdosed on some opioid analgesics, diazepam and Nyquil, trying to kick out flu-like symptoms. Their albums refine the crude public tools of all dull white blues bands into something awesome in its very insensitive grossness. Like a Cecil B. DeMille epic. If I rely so much on visual and filmic metaphors, it's because they apply so exactly. I've never made a Zep show, but friends, most of them the type, admittedly, who will listen to anything so long as it's loud and they're destroyed, describe a thunderous, near undifferentiated tidal wave of sound that doesn't engross, but envelopes to snuff any possible distraction. 
Bingo! Lester Banks never made it to a Zeppelin show, yet he dares to speak such insults against their fan base. What a difference it would have made for him to witness the band's magic on stage. Their third album deviates little from the track laid by the first two, even though they go acoustic on several numbers. Most of the acoustic stuff sounds like standard Zepp graded down decibel-wise, and the heavy blitzes could have been outtakes from Zeppelin too. In fact, when I first heard the album my main impression was the consistent anonymity of most of the songs. No one could mistake the band, but no gimmicks stand out with any special outrageousness, as did the great, gleefully absurd orangutan plant come wheezing guitar freakout that made whole lot of love such a pulp classic. Lester described what makes the third album so special, balance and the best of both worlds. But his jab at Robert Plant definitely makes me think Lester didn't bang anyone and spend his evenings alone with no pulp. Immigrant Song comes closest with its bulldozer rhythms and Bobby Plant's double track wordless vocal croonings echoing behind the main vocal like some cannibal chorus wailing in the infernal light of a savage fertility rite. What's great about it though, the Zepp's special genius, is that the whole effect is so utterly two-dimensional and unreal. You could play it, as I did, while watching a pagan priestess performing the ritual dance of Ka before the flaming sacrificial altar and fire maidens of outer space with the TV sound turned off. And believe me, the Zep made my blood throb to those jungle rhythms even more frenziedly. <laughs> Unfortunately, precious little of Z3's remaining hysteria is as useful or as effectively melodramatic. Friends has a fine bitter acoustic lead, but gives itself over almost entirely to monotonously shrill plant breast beatings. Rob, give a listen to Iggy Stooge. The critic missed the point of Friends and its Eastern music influences, aiming at the drone effect. Celebration Day and Out on the Tiles are production line Zepp churners that no fan could fault and no one else could even hear without an effort. Since I've been loving you represents the obligatory slow and lethally dull seven minute blues jam. And Hats Off to Roy Harper dedicates a bottleneck dash and shimmering echo chamber vocal salad to a British minstrel who, I am told, leans more towards the music hall tradition. Lester Banks calls Since I've Been Loving You, lethally dull. How dare you, man. <laughs> I laugh at this, really. This song made me want to pick up a guitar and shook my world. 22 plus years later, I am lethally crazy. Much of the rest, after a couple of listenings to distinguish between songs, is not bad at all because the disc Zeppelin are at least creative enough to apply an occasional pleasing fill-up to their uninspiring material and professional enough to keep all their recorded work relatively clean and clear. You can hear all the parts, which is more than you can say for many of their peers. Well, at least he recognized Zeppelin's clean and clear production values compared to their peers. That's very kind of you, Mr. Bangs. Finally, I must mention a song called That's the Way! because it's the first song they've ever done that has truly moved me. Son of a gun, it's beautiful. Above a very simple and appropriately everyday acoustic riff, Plant sings a touching picture of two youngsters who can no longer be playmates because one's parents and peers disapprove of the other because of long hair and being generally from. The dark side of town, the vocal is restrained for once. In fact, Plant's intonations are as plaintively gentle as some of the Rascals' best ballad work, and a perfectly modulated electronic drone wails in the background like melancholy harbor scows as the words fall soft as sooty snow. And yesterday I saw you standing by the river slash, I read those tears that filled your eyes slash, and all the fish that lay in dirty water dying slash, had they got you hypnotized? Beautiful, and strangely enough, Seth. As Sage Barry declared eons ago, it sure goes to show you never can tell. Wow, miracles do happen. I 100% agree with the critic here. That's the way is the most touching song on the album, and something that truly signaled into the acoustic works of the fourth album, shedding positive light on the songwriting beyond the heavy attack the band was known for. 
Okay, now on to Untitled's review by Patti Smith's guitarist, Lenny Kay. This was published on December 23rd, 1971, just as Led Zeppelin finished their UK winter tour in support of their new album. It might seem a bit incongruous to say that Led Zeppelin, a band never particularly known for its tendency to understate matters, has produced an album which is remarkable for its low-keyed and tasteful subtlety. But that's just the case here. The march of the dinosaurs that broke the ground for their first epic release has apparently vanished, taking along with it the splattering electronics of their second effort and the leaden acoustic moves that seemed to weigh down their third. What's been saved is the pumping adrenaline drive that held the key to such classics as Communication Breakdown and Whole Lot of Love, the incredibly sharp and precise vocal dynamism of Robert Plant, and some of the tightest arranging and producing Jimmy Page has yet seen his way toward doing. If this thing with the semi-metaphysical title isn't quite their best to date, since the very chances that the others took meant they would visit some outrageous highs as well as some overbearing lows, it certainly comes off as their most consistently good. Great opening there, Lenny. One of the ways in which this is demonstrated is the sheer variety of the album. Out of eight cuts, there isn't one that steps on another's toes, that tries to do too much all at once. There are old English ballads, The Battle of Evermore, with a lovely performance by Sandy Denny, a kind of pseudo-blues just to keep in touch, for sticks, a pair of authentic Zeppelinania, Black Dog, and Misty Mountain Hop, some stuff that I might actually call shy and poetic if it didn't carry itself off so well, Stairway to Heaven, and Going to California. You're right on track there, Lenny, keep going. And a couple of songs that when all is said and done, will probably be right up there in the gold-starred hierarchy of Put Em On and Play Em Again. The first, coyly titled, Rock and Roll, is the Zeppelin's slightly late attempt at tribute to the mother of us all, but here it's definitely a case of better late than never. This Sinovovich moves, with Planton using vocally on how, It's been a long, lonely, lonely time, since last he rock and rolled, the rhythm section soaring underneath. Page strides up to take a nice lead during the break, one of the all too few times he flashes his guitar prowess during the record, and its note for note simplicity says a lot for the ways in which he's come of age over the past couple of years. Lenny is on a roll here, guys. The energy of rock and roll moves people. It's just impossible not to make a duck face and play air guitar when this song comes up on the radio. The end of the album is saved for when the levee breaks, strangely credited to all the members of the band plus Memphis Mini, and it's a dazzler. Basing themselves around one honey of a chord progression, the group constructs an air of tunnel-long depth, full of stunning resolves and a majesty that sets up as a perfect climax. Led Zepp have had a lot of imitators over the past few years, but it takes cuts like this to show that most of them have only picked up the style, lacking any real knowledge of the meat underneath. Aha, uh -huh, they got it down all right. And since the latest issue of Cashbox noted that this one was a gold disc on its first day of release, I guess they're about to nicely keep it up. Not bad for a pack of limey lemon squeezers. You tell it how it is, Lenny K. These limey lemon squeezers would soon conquer America and squeeze them out of hundreds of thousands of concert dollars. Next in line is reporter Gordon Fletcher with his review of Houses of the Holy, dated June 7th, 1973, when Ned Zeppelin was back in England for a short vacation time before coming back for leg two of their North American tour on July 6th. For me, Led Zeppelin began as the epitome of everything good about rock, solid guitar work, forceful vocals and rhythmic backing, devotion to primal blues forms, and most of all, thunderous excitement on stage and vinyl. But as superstardom came to them, so too came the gradual evaporation of those qualities from their sound. In the same way that the Rolling Stones evolved into a senior, safe, bizarro perversion band, Led Zeppelin has become a senior, safe, heavy metal band. What'd you say? Nothing, what? We're just breaking balls. Hold this. But by its very nature safety cannot coexist with heavy metal fire and macho intensity, or bizarro perversion, for that matter. Which is probably why Houses of the Holy is one of the dullest and most confusing albums I've heard this year. Uh oh. I'm not sure what Gordon was on at the time of writing this, but he's unfortunately right about the confusing aspect of the record. I love this album, of course, but Houses of the Holy certainly took some music style liberties that were hard to come by for many fans. Thus why the album still hasn't found its right place in history, being in the middle of Untitled and Graffiti. 
Even after a hundred listenings I'm still not convinced this album is by the same group that brought us the likes of, Communication Breakdown, Heartbreaker, and, Black Dog. The powerfully simplistic rhythms and surging adrenaline drive that made those songs so compelling is nowhere to be found. You know, I had to vandalize your ass with my foot. Only once is it attempted, on, the ocean, but there it's so diluted with pointless humor that the necessary musical tension never develops. Jimmy Page's guitar spits jagged fireballs with John Paul Jones and John Bonham riffing along behind him, but the effect is destroyed by ridiculous backup cooings in an overbearing, killer, coda that's so blatant it can only be taken as a mock of straight rock and roll. Rock and roll, to the contrary, Led Zeppelin's forte has always been rock and the blues. If they took themselves seriously they'd realize that they are foolish to step outside that genre. I don't get Rolling Stone magazine. First they criticized these guys for taking themselves too serious, now it's a problem to have some fun. The only other tune approaching the Zepp's past triumphs is, the song remains the same, a slice of hootum that works solely as a vehicle for Page's guitar antics. And that's really what Led Zeppelin's been about from the start. Interesting things abound in what amounts to a 524 guitar solo, groin rattling riffing, a clever fuzz run, and some finger picked figures executed with a finesse that belies their macho origin. And Page manages to run through this hefty gamut without once being self indulgent. It's not the music that made Led Zeppelin famous, their style is hardly interchangeable with the Who's, but at least it's got more than an amp or two of the excitement that they're renowned for. And on this album, that alone is a major triumph. I agree with Fletcher here. The song remains the same, is a glorious opener, an overture that sounds like Led Zeppelin playing in the style of Yes, Jimmy sounds like Steve Howe. You can see what I mean on my Making of Houses of the Holy series. Two songs are naked imitations, and they're easily the worst things this band has ever attempted. The Crunch reproduces James Brown so faithfully that it's every bit as boring, repetitive and cliched as, good foot, yakety yak guitar, boom boom bass, astoundingly idiotic lyrics, when she walks, she walks, and when she talks, she talks, it's all there. So is Jones' synthesizer, spinning absolutely superfluous electronic fills. Dior McCare is even worse, a pathetic stab at reggae that would probably get the Zepp laughed off the island if they bothered playing it in Jamaica. Like every other band following rock's latest fad, Led Zeppelin shows little understanding of what reggae is about. Dear McCare is obnoxiously heavy-handed and totally devoid of the native form's sensibilities. I can understand why the critic was offended by these numbers. It's really a curveball that's not everybody's cup of tea. To think they recorded the Rover and Houses of the Holy for these sessions and decided to leave them out, John Bonham hated Jamaica, so he probably read this part of the review out loud to his buddies and said, Told you mates, it was a bad idea. The truly original songs on Houses of the Holy again underscore Led Zeppelin's songwriting deficiencies. Their earliest successes came when they literally stole blues licks note for note, so I guess it should have been expected that there was something drastically wrong with their own material. So it is that, Dancing Days, The Rain Song, and, No Quarter, fall flat on their respective faces. The first is filler while the latter two are nothing more than drawn out vehicles for the further display of Jones' unknowledgeable use of Mellotron and synthesizer. F*** you. Gordon. <laughs> Jones' use of Mellotron and synthesizer works in favor of the music. He was a choir master at age 14 and could play a church organ with his eyes closed. If only the critic could understand the magic of arrangements. Now I can see why he thought Dancing Days was filler. I still cannot enjoy this track because of its high treble mix. I much rather listen to live versions of it. And again, the band had The Rover as an outtake from these sessions. I think it's better than Dancing Days. Over the Hills and Far Away is cut from the same mold as Stairway to Heaven, but without that song's torrid guitar solo it languishes in Dulzville, just like the first five minutes of Stairway. The whole premise of graduated heaviness, upon which both songs were built, really goes to show just how puerile and rudimentary this group can get when forced to scrounge for its own material. One would think that the group that stole whole lot of love at all might acquire an idea or two along the way, but evidently they weren't looking. Let's hear it for androids. Great observation by the critic on Over the Hills having a similar construction to Stairway. It definitely shares the light and shade aspect, like a sister song of sorts. Led Zeppelin didn't steal the music for Hola Love. It was Robert Plant who borrowed some lyrics, which was later resolved by adding Willie Dixon on the credits. I don't know why Gordon had to go there. Unnecessary. When you really get down to it Led Zeppelin hasn't come up with a consistent crop of heavy metal spuds since their second album. Their last three efforts have been so uneven that had they started with Led Zeppelin 3 I'm convinced they wouldn't be here today. While they've been busy denying their blues rock roots, Robert Plant's vocals have lost their power and the band's instrumental work has lost its traces of spontaneity. 
In simple fact of matter, Houses of the Holy was 17 months in preparation, yet Led Zeppelin 1, the product of a mere 15 hours, cuts it to shreds. Gordon is wrong about the album's preparation time. It was not 17 but 11 months. But I got to give him props for noticing Plant's change in vocals. To think this was noticeable for people listening to Zeppelin's fifth album? I can't imagine the pressure the band felt to overcome this. So all in all it's been two separate groups we've called Led Zeppelin, and I've tired of waiting for the only legitimate one to return. An occasional zinger like, when the levy breaks, isn't enough, especially when there are so many other groups today that don't bullshit around with inferior tripe like, Stairway to Heaven. Beck, Boggart and Apiece, Black Sabbath, The Groundhogs, Robin Trower, the list is long and they all fare musically better than the Zep because they stick to what they do best. Page and friends should similarly realize their limitations and get back to playing the blues rock that moves mountains. Until they do Led Zeppelin will remain limp blimp. Our next stop is Physical Graffiti by Jim Miller. This was published on March 27, 1975, the very same day that Zeppelin played their last show from their 10th North American tour. I'm sure the band read this review waking up at noon the next day. They've sparked riots from Boston to Milan, sold out concerts from Hong Kong to Hamburg. Each of their five previous albums has gone platinum, selling more than one million copies. One, Led Zeppelin, four, has sold more than three million. They've set new records for U.S. concert attendance, drawing 56,800 to a single show in Tampa, Florida in 1973 and 120,000 to six concerts in the New York area in 1975. On paper at least, Led Zeppelin is unquestionably the world's most popular rock band. Yes, but is it the world's best rock band? That the question should even arise reflects not only this band's status, but also the current state of the music. What's the competition? The Rolling Stones? The Who? And? Moreover, with the release of Physical Graffiti, Led Zeppelin's sixth album, the question has actually become relevant. This two-record set, the product of almost two years' labor, is the band's Tommy, Beggar's Banquet, and Sgt. Pepper rolled into one. Physical Graffiti is Led Zeppelin's bid for artistic respectability. In a virtual recapitulation of the group's career, Physical Graffiti touches all the bases. There's a blues in My Time of Dying and a cosmic come heavy ballad in the light, there's an acoustic interlude brawny or and lots of bludgeoning hard rock, still this band's forte houses of the holy, the wanton song, there are also hints of Bo Diddley. Custard Pie, Burt Bacharach, Down by the Seaside, and Cool and the Gang Trampled Underfoot. If nothing else, physical graffiti is a tour de force. I like how this review begins with some context. It's respectful and prepares the reader for what's next. The album's and the band's mainspring is Jimmy Page, guitarist extraordinaire. It was Page who formed Led Zeppelin in 1968 after the model of such guitar-oriented blues rock units as Cream, the Jeff Beck Group, and the Yardbirds where Page, a former session man, had first come to prominence. And it is Page who continues to chart Zeppelin's contemporary course, not only as the group's lead guitarist, but also as the band's producer. His primary concern, both as producer and guitarist, is sound. His playing lacks the lyricism of Eric Clapton, the funk of Jimi Hendrix, the rhythmic flair of Peter Townsend, but of all the virtuoso guitarists of the 60s, Page, along with Hendrix, has most expanded the instrument's sonic vocabulary. And here we have the first blow that Miller manages to turn into a positive in elevating Page to the same heights of Jimi Hendrix for his sonic contributions. He has always exhibited a studio musician's knack for functionalism. Unlike many of his peers, he rarely overplays, especially on record, and Led Zeppelin has never indulged itself with a live LP. Just wait one more year, Jim Miller, and you'll get a double vinyl album worth of virtuoso Led Zeppelin on stage. Most of his playing instead evidences the restraint and rounded style of his avowed influences, the brooding, involuted blues lines of Otis Rush, the finely filigreed acoustic form of Burt Janch, the echoed. Subliminally driving accompaniments of Scotty Moore behind Elvis Presley and James Burton behind Ricky Nelson on early rockabilly records. A facile soloist, Page excels at fills, obligatos, and tags. Playing off stock riffs, he modulates sonorities, developing momentum by modifying instrumental colors. To this end, he uses a wide array of effects, including on physical graffiti some echoed slide, time of dying, a countryish vibrato, seaside, even a swimming, clear tone reminiscent of Lonnie Mac, the solo on The Rover. But his signature remains distortion. 
avoiding clean timbers, Page usually pits fuzzed out overtones against a hugely recorded bottom, weaving his guitar in and out of the total mix, sometimes echoing Robert Plant's contorted screams, sometimes tunneling behind a dryly thudding drum. This guy really gets the production values of Led Zeppelin. I'm guessing Richard Cole was pointing a gun on him while writing this. A fantastic description of graffiti, it is. Page's instrumental cohorts are John Paul Jones and John Bonham. Jones, another studio veteran, contributes keyboards as well as bass and is responsible via his use of synthesizer for bringing fullness as well as funk to the band. Bonham, on the other hand, is a Steak and Potatoes percussionist, handpicked, one assumes, for his ability to supply a plodding, stolid, rock-solid bottom no one has ever accused Led Zeppelin of swinging. Jim Miller forgot the secret behind Bonham's sound. His swing. His feel came from his swing. He had a heavy hand, yes, but his swing was second to none. Fronting the band on stage and sharing the spotlight with Page is vocalist Robert Plant. Like the Who's Roger Daltrey, he is a singer of limited range and feeling, but he projects himself with an irrepressible flair. Plant's acrobatics in fact complement Page's preoccupation with sound. Not only does Plant warble limply as well as scream, he also adds yet another gravelly component to the band. In his production of Plant, Page constantly plays on this grittiness, the vocal counterpart to the distorted sound of his own guitar. Now, if you watch my Making of Physical Graffiti series, you know I talked about Robert Plant having vocal nodule surgery in late 1973 and how the 1974 sessions found him learning how to use his new voice. Interesting that Critic picked up on this, but of course, he didn't know back then what the real reason for Plant's change of style on graffiti was. Although Zeppelin at the outset hewed closely to the standard blues rock format of the late 60s, the band soon abandoned blues retreads to concentrate on their own brand of hard rock. The group's first album, Led Zeppelin, already contained such departures as Dazed and Confused, a searing wall of sound that inspired a generation of heavy metal rockers. Communication Breakdown, also on the first LP, showed off the uptempo side of the Zeppelin format, with Page unleashing a blizzard of choppy chords. The jerky meter and crude attack remain favorite devices of Page, who, like Lieber and Stoller with the coasters, understands the art of contriving a raucous sound, consider rock and roll Zeppelin's other masterpiece of distilled freneticism. Thanks to Page's production, Led Zeppelin quickly outdistanced such predecessors as Cream and the Yardbirds. Not only was Plant a stronger singer than the Yardbirds' Keith Relf, but Page, in contrast to Clapton, Bruce, and Baker, grasped the importance of crafting a coherent ensemble approach. Taking his cues from Old Sun and Chess Records, he used reverb and echo to mold the band into a unit, always accenting the bottom, bass, and drums, always aiming at the biggest possible sound. As a result, Zeppelin's early records still sound powerful, while Cream tracks like White Room in retrospect sound pale and disjointed. On such classics as Whole Lotta Love, Page's production set new standards for recording hard rock. By 1971 and the release of the fourth Led Zeppelin album, Page and the band had broadened their approach to include acoustic ballads and folk-derived material, a side of the band introduced on Led Zeppelin III. Stairway to Heaven, the band's most popular song, delicately balanced acoustic and electric elements before climaxing in a patented fuzz assault. Plant's controlled singing and Page's development of texture both distinguish this track, which to this day confounds critics who denigrate Zeppelin as a band schooled only in the art of excess. But in fact, an attention to detail and a sense of economy and nuance have become hallmarks of the Zeppelin style. For Styx, from Led Zeppelin IV, to take a trifling example, sustains momentum by alternating a distorted electric riff with an acoustic progression doubled on keyboards. The percussion recalls Elvis's mystery train more than Cream's sunshine of your love, and it adds just the right touch of elegance to an otherwise elementary cut. Physical graffiti only confirms Led Zeppelin's preeminence among hard rockers. Although it contains no startling breakthroughs, it does afford an impressive overview of the band's skill. On Houses of the Holy, Plant's lyrics mesh perfectly with Page's stuttering licks. Here again, the details are half the fun, Bonham kicks the cut along with a cowbell while the two final verses add what sounds like a squeaky chorus of Doit S behind the vocal. Plant, meanwhile, is almost inaudibly overdubbed on the song's central chorus, underlining the phrase, let the music be your master. Throughout the album, Page and the band tap a strange lot of sources, although the result is always pure Zeppelin. 
On 10 Years Gone, a progression recalling the Beatles' Dear Prudence resolves in a beautifully waddling refrain, page scooping broad and fuzzy chords behind Plant, who sounds a lot like Rod Stewart. Elsewhere, the band trundles out the Marrakesh Symphony Orchestra for Kashmir, Ian Stewart's piano, and even a mandolin, both for Boogie with Stew. Small matter, Jimmy Page could probably arrange a quartet for finger cymbals and have it come lumbering out of the loudspeakers sounding like Led Zeppelin. Ten Years Gone does not resemble Dear Prudence, but okay. What's with the critics comparing Robert Plant to Rod Stewart? What did Percy do to you, man? I suspect he stole your lady at a Zeppelin show. Naturally, Graffiti is not without faults, Zeppelin is too intuitive a band to cut a flawless album. Although Page and Bonham mount a bristling attack on The Rover, this track, like several others, suffers from Plant's indefinite pitch. Other cuts, such as the 10-minute Cashmere and In My Time of Dying, succumb to monotony. In the light, one of the album's most ambitious efforts similarly fizzles down the home stretch, although the problem here is not tedium but a fragmentary composition that never quite gels. When Page on the final release plays an ascending run intended to sound majestic, the effect is more stilted than stately. I wouldn't call monotony on graffiti. They certainly extended many portions, and like I said on my Making Of series, this creates a copy-paste effect on the epic numbers, where the element of surprise is just repeated. This of course created the problem of the 1974 track's running time exceeding a single vinyl release, thus the need to dig through the outtakes for a double album. But of course, some critics at the time did not know these were outtakes. Despite such lapses, physical graffiti testifies to Page's taste and Led Zeppelin's versatility. Taken as a whole, it offers an astonishing variety of music produced impeccably by Page. Not that this album will convince the doubters. Anyone with an antipathy to the posturing of Robert Plant or the wooden beat of John Bonham be forewarned. A Led Zeppelin is a Led Zeppelin is a Led Zeppelin. Physical graffiti will likely also disappoint those who prefer their rock laced with lyrical significance. Led Zeppelin no more articulates a worldview than Little Richard or Cream did. Yet while Zeppelin's stature as cultural spokesmen can be questioned, their standing as rock musicians cannot. True, Led Zeppelin misses the swagger of the Stones, the kinetics of the Who. But on physical graph. The review ends on the last part of but on physical graph. I'm not sure if this is a Rolling Stone archive problem, but there you have it. Now on to Presence, written by American journalist and the author of the controversial Hammer of the Gods book, Stephen Davis. His words were published on May 20th, 1976, just four days after Page and Plant played an encore at Bad Company's show at the LA Forum. Led Zeppelin's seventh album confirms this quartet's status as heavy metal champions of the known universe. Presence takes up where last season's monumentally molten physical graffiti left off few melodies, a preoccupation with hard rock rhythm, lengthy echoing moans gushing from Robert Plant and a general lyrical slant toward the cosmos. Give an Englishman 50,000 watts, a chartered jet, a little cocaine and some groupies and he thinks he's a god. It's getting to be an old story. Maybe Davis never played guitar through a 50,000 watt system, boarded a jet, did a little cocaine and some groupies to understand the power of a rock star. It's so easy to call this an old story, I sense envy. Not on the cocaine part, but the groupies. Physical graffiti was a penultimate of sorts. Trampled underfoot was the hardest rock ever played by humans, while Kashmir must be the most pompous, and the new record certainly tries to keep up. The opening track, Achilles' Last Stand, could be the Yard Birds, 12 years down the road. The format is familiar, John Bonham's furiously attacking drum is really the lead instrument, until Jimmy Page tires of courting under Plant and takes over. Although Page and Plant are masters of the form, emotions often conflict and the results are mixed. A few bars from One Piece convince the listener he's hearing the greatest of rock and roll, then the very next few place him in a nightmarish 1970 movie about deranged hippies. I wonder what the soundtrack for a movie of deranged hippies could be. Was Stephen Davis referring to Royal Orleans? For your life? Or hot on for nowhere? Actually there is some fine rock on presence. Nobody's fault but mine is strong. While Candy Store Rock perfectly evokes the Los Angeles milieu in which the Zep composed this album, it sounds like an unholy hybrid in which Buddy Holly is grafted onto the quivering stem of David Bowie. Zeppelin's main concern here is to establish a reliable riff and stick to it, without complicating things too much with melody or nuance. At their best, the riffs are clean and purifying. The two dreary examples of blues, T for one. 
for your life, may stretch even the diehard's loyalty, but make no mistake, presence is another monster in what by now is a continuing tradition of battles won by this band of survivors. This was a boring review, filled with passive-aggressive comments. I expected him to take a stand on things, or provide the right context. To call T for one a stretch is probably the fact that he has never experienced flying a private jet, doing a little cocaine and some groupies. He got one thing right, this was a band of survivors. While Davis probably boarded a bus, did a little weed, and no groupies. Next review takes us to October 18th, 1979, just six days before one of Jimmy's friends, Philip Churchill Hale, died from inhaling his own vomit at Paige's Plumpton house. Jimmy moved to a new house sometime later. He was also a month away from the Melody Maker Awards. This is Rolling Stone Magazine's take on In Through the Outdoor. Hearing John Bonham play the drums is the oral equivalent of watching Clint Eastwood club eight bad guys over the head with a 2x4 while driving a derailed locomotive through their hideout. Either you are horrified by all that blood on the floor, or you wish you could do it yourself. No one's ever going to accuse Bonham of subtlety, but everyone should give him credit for consistency. Even on Led Zeppelin's worst effort, Houses of the Holy, he flails with so much exuberance that I find myself hoping that thugs from strange foreign countries will attack me on the street so I can play Moby Dick on their strange foreign heads. <laughs> Playing Moby Dick to repel the attack of thugs sounds like a plan indeed. What a great line by Charles Young, a well-respected journalist who unfortunately passed away in 2014. Sadly, Bonham's exuberance on in through the outdoor is matched only by Robert Plant's appetite for inanity. Never a power as a lyric writer, Plant has followed a simple pattern in his singing. When Jimmy Page gave him great guitar riffs to phrase around, Plant was great. When Page didn't, Plant wasn't. On their masterpiece, Dazed and Confused, for example, Plant made the same old misogyny sound like profound insight, while Page thundered through his orchestral guitar rumble. Charles Young is wrong saying there are no great riffs on the album. You just gotta listen to it from an arranger point of view. Jimmy didn't lose an ounce of inspiration, he just took a backseat approach, landing Jones the wheel. Of the seven songs on In Through the Outdoor, only one has orchestral guitar rumble, and Plant's singing has fallen to the occasion in the other six. With this paucity of good music to work with, Plant fails to create phrasing good enough to disguise the lyrics, which are horrible. Three out of four tunes on side one are addressed to Baby. Granted that Plant is very upset with Baby because she left him, but 13 and a half minutes is stretching the morning period a bit far. That baby part is hilarious. Plant does talk about baby a lot. But hey, it's a miracle they bothered to record the album in the first place, given the circumstances. You can check my seven part making of Enzo the Outdoor for the story behind these songs. If perchance Robert Plant meets someone who doesn't dump on him, he should avoid calling her the apple of my eye, or she will probably reject him, just as I am rejecting, I'm gonna crawl, in which he sings that cliché almost as if it meant something. Any band portraying itself as mystical romantic poets ought to go to the minimal trouble of being obscure enough to cover up its lack of anything to say. Once again I think the critic ignored what Robert went through after Carrick's passing. I'm gonna crawl is certainly a fine piece of music with one of Jimmy's best guitar solos. As you might suspect, In Through the Outdoors' best number is the one in which you can understand the least words. This is, in the evening, a classic Zeppelin orchestral guitar rumble halfway between, when the levee breaks, and, in the light. The only line I was able to understand was, oh, oh I need zoo love. Judging by Plant's convincing orgasmic moans on the rest of it, I would rather guess at the remaining lyrics. Back when Led Zeppelin was setting the heavy metal standard, LP's I Through IV, for all time, Jimmy Page was coming up with two or three great guitar riffs on damn near every tune. A lot of them were copped from Mississippi Delta blues masters like Robert Johnson, but knowing where to steal is every great artist's dirty little secret. Page now appears to have fallen victim to the law of diminishing returns, because, in the evening, has the only great guitar riff on the entire album. The rest of the songs are based on John Paul Jones' keyboard work. Though an excellent musician, Jones functions best behind Page, not in front of him. Side 2 consists of three of the least effective songs the band has ever recorded. Caris Alhambra, the opener, is built on an extremely lame keyboard riff and clocks in at an absurd 1028. Repetition to weave a hypnotic effect has always been part of the Zeppelin sound, but what they are repeating here is not worth the effort. All My Love and I'm Gonna Crawl, both slow and incorporating synthesized violins, let the record peter out instead of climax. Side 1 qualifies as occasionally interesting, particularly the heavy metal square dance, Hot Dog, and Bonham driving a locomotive through the mariachi, I think, beat in the middle of Fool in the Rain, but the only cut I'll return to with any enthusiasm is In the Evening. A lame keyboard riff, huh? As someone who recorded an acoustic guitar cover of this song, 
I am deeply hurt by this comment. To say all my love and I'm gonna crawl, let the record peter out is just one of the reasons many classic rock bands sucked in the 80s. Few had the vision and taste to go into new terrains, and Jumple Jones created some of the most innovative Zeppelin sounds since 1970. I'm guessing critics wanted these bands to sound the same as 1971, and then they would criticize them for sticking to the same formula in their 30s. Now it's funny how the critics thought Bonham drove a locomotive mariachi beat in Full in the Rain. I'm guessing he never listened to any samba or Latin music in general. I thought Van Halen was going to be the next Led Zeppelin until they succumbed to the law of diminishing returns on their second album. Now, with Page's creativity apparently failing and no one able to compensate, even Led Zeppelin is not Led Zeppelin. I wonder who wants the throne bad enough to take it. This right here is ironic considering Van Halen sort of crowned the 80s with their keyboard dominated piece Jump, which was sort of based on the idea for Carlos Alhambra. But of course the media won't tell you this because they love to crap on an album I have 56 copies of and counting. Coda is next with Rolling Stone's legendary 80s editor, Kurt Loder. He would also be known for hosting MTV News and wrote some of the liner notes for Zeppelin's box set number two. His review came out on January 20th, 1983, some 11 days after Jimmy Page's 44th birthday. Coda is a resounding farewell from the greatest heavy metal band that ever strutted the boards. Produced by Jimmy Page, the album chronicles a 10-year adventure in high guitar drama and maximum blast. If the record seems a bit of a cheat time wheeze, it clocks in at 32 to 40, the song's selection is a marvel of compression, deftly tracing the Zeppelin decade with eight powerful, previously unreleased tracks, and no unnecessary elaboration. The Kurt the Loader, opening up his text with a great intro. That's how you do it. Side 1 is Early Days. The opener, a frontal assault on Ben E. King and James Bathia's We're Gonna Groove, is definitive a 1969 raunch. The essential elements of Zeppelin sound are already firmly in place. Page's propulsive guitar playing, Robert Plant's peeling vocal, John Paul Jones' duty-bound bass, and the late John Bonham's creature with, the, Adam, brain drumming. Poor Tom, from 1970, isn't completely successful at mating an acoustic guitar turn with an insistent drum tattoo, but it does demonstrate Page's links to the Burt Janch John Renborn school of urbane folk picking. The walking bass rendition of Willie Dixon's, I Can't Quit You Baby, tossed off at a sound check that same year, perfectly captures the blues mania of the period, complete with a classically overwrought guitar solo. More impressive is Page's frantic, trebly cording on Walter's Walk, which recalls Paul Burleson's steaming leads with Johnny Burnett's rock and roll trio in the mid-50s. This seems to be the most favorable Le Zeppelin review ever. Maybe John Bonham's untimely passing softened the evil offices of Rolling Stone. Side 2 skips ahead to November 1978 for three outtakes from the Stockholm sessions for In Through the Outdoor, Zeppelin's last LP before the group's sundering death of John Bonham. Recorded at ABBA's state-of-the-art Polar Studios, these tracks, the bone-rattling Ozone Baby, the hypnotic Darlene and Wearing and Tearing, are about as wonderful as hard rock and roll gets. Completing the picture, there was no getting around this, is Bonzo's Montreux, recorded in Switzerland in 1976. Extended rock drum solos are notoriously the pits, but this one, electronically enhanced by Page and executed with considerable panache by Bonham's drum orchestra, is true to the spirit of Sandy Nelson, and thus vestigially nifty at the very least. Coda is an honest and honorable career profile, and a classy way to go out. Bravo Kurt Loader, bravo. But somehow record buyers didn't feel the same way and ignored the album at stores. Now it didn't help Thriller was released three days after Coda. You can check my making of video on my post Let's Help Play 1980 series. Okay, now for a kicker. Here's Kurt Loader again, but this time offering his thoughts on Robert Plant's debut, Pictures at 11. The date was August 16th, 1982, just four days before Robert's 34th birthday. If Robert Plant were young and hungry instead of nearly 34 and famous, this album might have been a real barn burner. As it is, even though there's nothing new going on in these grooves, the sheer formal thrill of hearing someone who knows exactly what he's doing makes pictures at 11 something of an event almost in spite of its modest ambitions. Plant's freak of nature voice, the definitive heavy metal shriek, has seldom been more sympathetically showcased, even with Led Zeppelin. 
You still can't make out a lot of what he's saying, but his vocals are distinguished by a fullness and fluidity that's richly satisfying. The production, by Plant, is artfully simple, and the band he's put together to back him, Robbie Blunt, the fine guitarist from the Steve Gibbons band, bassist Paul Martinez, Jez Woodroffe on keyboards, and Phil Collins and Cozy Powell, who share drum duties, sounds like it could kill on stage. A great summary of the emotions behind the making of Pictures at Levin, which you can check on my post Led Zeppelin 1980 series. Kurt was right, this band definitely crushed the stage on their 1983 tour. Blunt, in particular, deserves a steady star gig. Not only is he an ace instrumentalist in the metal tradition, check out the schizo guitar lashings on the raving mystery title, but he also co-wrote, mostly with Plant, the album's eight tracks, and so presumably was responsible for such outre touches as the dense, ensemble lines toward the end of, Worse Than Detroit. One hopes that the Plant Blunt collaboration will bear further fruit, because it's a winner. Burning Down One Side, the lead-off track, is a dead-on target hit, a neck-ringing riff spiced with effortlessly atmospheric guitar leads, while the charming, fat lip, a bluesy riff located at the other end of the emotional spectrum, could almost give laid back a good name again. Robert Blunt getting the recognition he deserves. Robert's best solo career guitarist of all time. Kurt Loder can see past Robert's famous name to understand how these songs came to be after the tragic demise of Led Zeppelin. Robert wanted the process to feel organic, far away from 70s excess. Elsewhere, Plant trots out his trademark bellow for Slow Dancer and the aforementioned mystery title and enlists the high, reedy tones of saxophonist Raphael Ravenscroft, noted for his work on the Jerry Rafferty hit, Baker Street, for the slightly unfocused, pledge pin. There are longers, Moonlight in Samosa, for instance, is sort of like, Stairway to Heaven, without the sonic liftoff, and, like I've never been gone, I see the sunlight in your eye -e 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 -e, is just sort of stupid. But when the good stuff on an album cuts all the other cockrock competition in sight, only a curmudgeon would complain. It's hard to make a review on this record, but Kurt Oder did the best he could. Robert Plant definitely took note for his follow-up, which remains one of the best records of the decade. And just because this has been fun, here's Rolling Stones' famous face, David Fricke, who wrote the liner notes for Mothership. This review of Outrider was published on August 25th, 1988, less than a month away from Jimmy's American tour that same year. The high priest of heavy metal, the pontiff of power riffing, and probably the most digitally sampled artist in pop today, after James Brown, guitar shaman Jimmy Page returns to the rock wars with his debut solo album, not counting the so-so, 82 soundtrack of Death Wish 2, just as the 80s Led Zeppelin renaissance goes into overdrive. What better opportunity to resend to big rock supremacy, while giving impudent pups like Kingdom Come and the cult I taste of the lash. <laughs> Too bad timing isn't everything. Because Outrider, to be painfully honest, is a whole lot of muddle. A bewildering amalgam of trademark pagey referama, utter lyric banality, thundering instrumental tracks topped off by hammy vocals, tantalizing hints of steaming futurist Zeppelin, and sudden U-turns back to the 70s. The album reiterates familiar gifts and well-documented strengths, yet lacks any clear-cut direction or sense of aesthetic mission. Too often Page echoes his past without transcending or building on it. Freaky had a tough job on this one. It was a brand new Jimmy Page album, but a disjointed effort that in retrospect did not live up to its potential. David was careful enough though to underline the strengths, but objectively point out the weaknesses. The opening numbers, wasting my time, and want to make love, summarize everything that's right and wrong, with Outrider. Working from the old black dog, dancing days schematic of muscular, choppy riffs layered with greasy slide guitar over jolting rhythm changes, Page kicks up a quintessential Zeppelin storm, abetted by drummer Jason Bonham, who does his old man proud throughout the record. The three-way collision of skidding bottleneck sounds, growling wah-wah, and stabbing lead work over Bonham's angry whack in Wanna Make Love, is classic page guitar kikesher. John Miles' lemon squeezer whale, though, has nothing on Robert Plant, and his generic lyrics edge dangerously close to parody. More satisfying, are the instrumentals Rites of Winter, 
and liquid mercury, which concentrate on riff alchemy and the glorious sound of Page's guitars dog fighting with each other in overdub. The instrumentals are certainly the high points of the album. I wish John Miles recorded another album with Jimmy. He was so much better than David Coverdale in my book. Side 2, which features the veteran English white soul howler Chris Farlow, is just as problematic. Instead of torching Leon Russell's hummingbird, Farlow practically incinerates it, and his idea of sexual innuendo on prison blues, I got my weasel in my pocket. I'm gonna stick it right down that little hole, makes David Coverdale sound like the Byron of Barum Erotica. Fortunately, Page uses prison blues to just go ape crazy on guitar. It may sound like 70s old hat, but it's great old hat, where it only matched more often by the shock of the new. What distinguishes the only one from the rest of the album, besides Robert Plant's guest vocal appearance, is the element of risk. Maybe it was just too much to expect a Zoso for the 90s on Page's first solo excursion, but Outrider is as much a victim of underachievement as of overexpectation. As a guitar record, Outrider proves Page is still the Sultan of Slash, the Kaiser of Crunch, but where he once held the hammer of the gods, he now sounds a bit dazed and confused. Freaky Pro thought, please don't hate me Jimmy Page after writing this. I admire his courage to state the obvious, as well as the problems behind the only solo album by Jimmy Page. What a terrible statistic this is. But such is life, right? I hope you enjoyed my review of Rolling Stones' reviews. Which one do you think was the worst? I'd like to know your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next episode. Bye bye.